just bear with me for a moment. Do, do you think that in a normal country, the failure of a former prime minister to hand over information to a, 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 it's a, is it a judicial inquiry to, a, to an official inquiry into the handling of the COVID pandemic, do you think the failure of a prime minister to hand over information demanded and set to a deadline <laughs> to an official inquiry into a pandemic, the governmental handling of a pandemic, his handling of a pandemic that killed tens of thousands of people, do you think that would be a slightly bigger story? Just, just, I'm just genuinely asking you, because you know me, I don't trust my antennae or, or, or indeed my news sense. But do you think that in a normal country, we can all agree this is not a normal country. Nadine Dorries was Secretary of State for Culture not long ago, and, and Jacob Rees-Mogg spent 10 minutes as Secretary of State for Business. So we know we're not a normal country anymore. We will be again, hopefully sooner rather than later. But do you think that in a normal country... That would be a rather bigger story than some of the stories getting acres of coverage. Imagine for a moment if the owners and editors of the Daily Mail and The Sun decided that a former prime minister failing to hand over information demanded by an official inquiry into his handling of an event that killed thousands of people was actually quite a big story. I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether the BBC is a seagull now or a fishing trawler. I've got a horrible feeling that in many areas it's a seagull. It, it follows the trawler. It's, it seeks to appease media organisations that are dedicated to its destruction. You cannot appease the Murdoch media if you are the BBC. What they should do differently, I don't know. But you can't appease them. And they've decided, uh, uh, the Murdoch media and the Mail and the Telegraph, that the failure of their boy, Johnson's now a Daily Mail columnist, how hard do you think they're going to go in the pursuit of truth or speaking truth to power when it comes to the failure of a prime minister, former prime minister, to hand over information? It's not just about a phone, it's information, it's communications between him and his key conciliaries at the outbreak in the early days of a, of, a, of a truly lethal pandemic. It's incredible, right? And it trends on Twitter, hashtag Boris Johnson's phone. I'm a big fan of Twitter, as you know, but it, Twitter's falling apart thanks to the intervention of a, of a plutocrat, a, a, a right-wing billionaire. It's incredible, really, uh, I mean, how straightforward and how predictable it's all been, but that's falling apart. Now, imagine, imagine if it was the Iraq inquiry and Tony Blair hadn't handed over his phone. Yeah, do you think that would be on the front pages today? Anybody? News at 10 maybe, going quite big on that. Tony Blair has failed to meet a deadline set by the official inquiry, the Hutton inquiry, into the Iraq war. He says he can't open his phone because some spies have told him not to. That's the country we're living in, right there. It's not a phone in this, I don't think. And I'm not normally a massive fan of counterfactuals, but I am reviewing that position daily now. What would happen? It's usually what would what would be happening now if this was Diane Abbott or something like that, because the uh, targets painted on her back by right wing media are you can see them from space. But that one there, imagine if it was a Labour prime minister. Uh, in fact, Chris has made the point. Imagine if Tony Blair was obstructing an Iraq inquiry. What do you think would be done to him? Um, seven minutes after ten is the time. If Gordon Brown sneezed in the wrong way, says Julie in Suffolk. It is quite, you've got to admit, I know you may well have your blue scarf tied so tightly around your neck that it's cut off the flow of blood to your brain, but it's democracy that gets damaged by this ludicrous scenario. Former Prime Minister refusing, actually, rather than failing, to hand over his uh, the phone containing the WhatsApp messages from the first months of the... And you know why he had to change phones? Do you remember why he had to change phones? Sorry, I will start the programme proper in a minute. I just wanted to get this off my chest because no one else is. Do you remember why he had to change phones? Because it turned out the number for his original phone was still on some press release that had been put out 10 years previously by a think tank when he was shadow education minister. So his phone had been in the public domain for the entirety of his premiership. At that point, they decided he better change his phone. And now apparently he can't turn it on again because spies have told him not to. I don't buy that, do you? And asking or thinking of the 
uh, difficulty of dedicating a radio phone-in programme to the very simple question of whether or not you believe a politician, that's actually what we're going to do next. We're going to do a phone-in on whether or not you believe a politician. We can't do this every day for two reasons. It's a bit lazy, and it's also uh, occasionally a bit pointless. You don't know what's in your mind, do you? You don't know what's in your mind, what's in the mind of somebody else. This, of course... God, back to Boris Johnson again. This, of course, is the point of Boris Johnson's political career. It, and it actually, I can't believe how right we got this, that idea. Do you remember the Jaffa Cakes story? I always think of the Jaffa Cakes if you want to work out how Boris Johnson lies. When I was a kid, uh, a student, I, I, I shared a house in Battersea with my best friend at the time. And one night, I found myself very hungry. And... The nearest shop was quite far away. We had separate food cupboards. You remember what it's like when you're in a shared house. We had separate food cupboards. I was the only person in the house. He was asleep upstairs, and I ate his Jaffa cakes. I ate an entire packet of Jaffa cakes, right? And he is, was, and always will be one of the sweetest, most good-natured, most mild-mannered people I have ever had the pleasure. He's godfather to one of my children. He is the loveliest man you could ever meet. I was at school with him for five years. I was at university with him for, for three. And we, we shared a, a, this place together for, for a year. And, and we're still great mates now. And I ate an entire packet of his Jaffa cakes while he slept upstairs. And then... For reasons I can't quite recall, I refused to admit that I'd done it. And it almost broke him psychologically. It was like a Guantanamo Bay style level of mental torture because it was such a ridiculous lie. But it was also impossible to prove that I was lying because the absence of the Jaffa cakes from his cupboard did not prove that I had lied. And about two years ago, when we were trying to unravel the egregious lies, the unbelievable and endless lies of Boris Johnson, long before, of course, he was found to be a massive liar by a, a jury of his own peers on the Privileges Committee, I realised that it's all about the Jaffa cakes. If you know it can't be proved or even if you are confident that it can't be proved, then it doesn't matter how much weight there is behind the accusation, you will be able to push through. You cannot prove, you remember this, you remember when all the sycophants and forelock targets came out to defend him, they all started saying, well, you don't know what was in his mind. You don't know what was, you can't read his mind. So he's obviously lying. Everybody knows he's lying. A bunch of freaks and fetishistic weirdos are determined to pretend that he's not lying and the only way they can do that is by claiming that what was actually in his mind was completely different from what came out of his mouth and what everybody else could see so when he said that he didn't know there were any parties he genuinely didn't know that there were any parties even though he was at them that that's that's what i mean you just you i didn't eat your jaffa cakes but i i know that you ate my jaffa cake. i saw them in the cupboard before i went to bed you were the only person in the house. Either you stole my Jaffa cakes or I got up in the middle of the night, ate them, and somehow managed to dispose... Because that was the other terrible thing I, I did. I, was like, I got rid of the packaging. The poor bloke emptied the bin in the kitchen to see if... It got, I mean, it was a horrible moment. It really was. Horrible moment. And I don't know why I'm ashamed. Ashamed of my behaviour. I really am. But I just refused to admit it. And that is what Robert Jenrick has learnt from Boris Johnson. Because here is Robert Jenrick claiming or explaining why he um, ordered the removal of the murals from the Asylum Processing Centre for unaccompanied children in Kent. And just keep the Jaffa cakes in the back of your mind. Is it true that he gave orders to the Asylum Reception Centre to paint over children's cartoons? And if so, why? Because nobody believes that Mickey Mouse cartoons either encourage or deter boats to arrive, and they simply think that this is the minister 
actually not showing some common decency towards vulnerable children. I've been clear in answer to uh, her right honourable friend that we provide very high quality care at all of the centres in which we support unaccompanied children. We, We didn't think that the setup in that particular unit was age appropriate because the majority of those individuals who were unaccompanied passing through it last year were teenagers. You you buying that, are you? The other story I normally tell at this point is the time that I went, if you've just tuned in for the first time, I don't always approach matters of grave national import with tales from my childhood and my and my student digs but I do also remember the time that I went strawberry picking in Chaddersley Corbett and I ate my own body weight in strawberries which left enormous amounts of strawberry juice all down my t-shirt and my shorts even my legs were bright red I mean I was ba- I was walking strawberry and I walked into the weighing area with the punnet containing the sort of seven strawberries that I'd actually put in the punnet rather than just gorging myself on them. And the farmer said, and you know when adults laugh when you're a kid and you, you, you kind of like it? it it's, and, and the farmer said, did you eat any strawberries? And I went, no, sir, like this. And every adult in the, in the, in the, in the tent in the marquee started laughing their socks off. That's also, I mean, you, I mean you, obviously I'd eaten a lot of strawberries. So do you believe Robert Jenrick? Let's just remind ourselves what happened in the House of Lords when the same issue was raised with a uh, Home Office minister who I, I had to look him up. Turns out Liz Truss put him in the House of Lords. 49 days as Prime Minister and she still gets to put people in the House of Lords, including this character. To the arrival centre in Dover, which had cartoons and welcoming signs for children and which were ordered to be removed by the Home Office Minister because it might make the children feel too welcome. Isn't that a disgrace? And and isn't it time that government backbenchers felt as embarrassed as we are that this is happening in our country? Uh, The uh, murals that the noble lord refers to were provided by our detention contractors and were not commissioned or approved by the Home Office. Uh, And uh, it's the clearly... Uh, the correct decision that uh, these um, uh, facilities uh, have the uh, requisite uh, decoration befitting their purpose. My lords. My lords. It was Alf Dubbs, of course, asking the question. Lord Dubbs, himself a beneficiary of the kinder transport, so a man who knows of what he speaks. So two Home Office ministers there... um, Jenrick and what's the other fellow's name? Is it Simon Simon something? Simon Murray? Simon Murray. Uh, offering up two completely different stories. I, I, if you're going to tell a lie, lads, get your story straight. Seriously. Was it, was it or they were taken down because they'd been put up without authority by the people who did the decorating at the detention centre or they were taken down because you felt they were inappropriate for the teenagers passing through? Because I'll tell you one thing about teenagers, traumatised teenagers who've made their way to the UK via some of the most torturous and, and hideous and, uh, and terrifying routes imaginable. They're really they're going to be furious if there's a picture of Mickey Mouse on the wall when they finally get to safety. I mean, seriously, they might have escaped from the Taliban, but Tom and Jerry, that could be what tips them over the edge. You better get those, you get those murals down fast, get those murals down quick. Well played, Bobby Jenrick. I honestly, top priority for a Home Office immigration minister, get those murals off those walls. They're teenagers over there, for God's sake.